I'd like to just offer a few general observations on a in response to some of the programming that we saw this morning. Uh, whenever I speak on behalf of DTI at events, my goals are usually twofold. Um, the first is to educate new audiences on this oft forgotten, sometimes misunderstood right. And the other is to really drive home the point that we are at a turning point for data portability. Uh, I think this latter point is certainly one that we uh, heard as a repeating theme uh, over and over again today. We heard speakers allude to just how seriously the EU is taking this issue. We heard predictions that many others will likely follow suit. Uh, we heard how the DMA's new requirements are presenting never before seen questions. Um, and we touched on how all around the world we are seeing newfound uh, and renewed interest in data portability, I think in recognition of its role uh, in providing greater consumer choice, competition, and innovation. We were fortunate, very, very fortunate, and honored to start the day off with Senator Markey, um, who reiterated that this boundary-breaking work, as he uh, explained it, is crucial to user empowerment, to competition, to innovation. Um, he reiterated that the principles of interoperability and data portability are more important than ever and essentially um, it, to maintaining internet freedom, although he was much more eloquent <laughs> in how he said it. Um, we heard discussions about the roots of portability in both data protection and competition uh, and the various delicate trade-offs uh, that must be considered. And we heard about the role of trust and collaboration. At the beginning of the day, we reiterated that the theme of today is user empowerment. Um, and honestly, it's the theme, I would say it's the theme, uh, it's the mission of our organization. So one takeaway was, you know, I found it really heartening to hear multiple speakers on various panels uh, reiterate just how important it is to understand what consumers want uh, to get more signal from them because uh, ultimately, uh, and DTI believes this strongly, the, the tools that we prioritize and build should depend on what users want. Uh, I was also really pleased to hear that user, everyone seemed to agree that user education is such a big component of this. How do we make folks aware uh, of the data portability tools and options that are available to them? Um, but I think, you know, one of the most important takeaways for me uh, was the importance of a multidisciplinary approach to uh, solving these problems. Uh, it was a major thought process in planning the summit, and as Chris has acknowledged often, uh, we cannot do our technical or policy work in a vacuum. Uh, it, Beyond this workshop, collaboration with a diverse set of stakeholders will continue to be a huge priority for, for DTI, and we're very excited to, to continue conversations. Um, you know, there were so many cutting-edge conversations, and there's so many more to come throughout the day, but just wanted to share those thoughts and, and those takeaways, um, and thank you for being here with us today. And with that now, I would like to, uh, we'd like to move on to our fireside chat. Um, if I could uh, introduce Dr. Travis Hall to the stage and find my notes. <laughs> uh, just one moment. Oh, okay. So, uh, well, I'll come, I'll come over there in a minute, but I'm, we're really pleased to introduce Dr. Travis Hall, who serves as Acting Associate Administrator of NTIA's Office of Policy Analysis and Development. Um, so, uh, thank you so much. And, and so I'd love to start this conversation by asking you what OPAD's top priorities are right now. Uh, sure. And so first off, uh, thank you to DTI. Uh, thank you to Chris for um, having me here. Thanks to everybody for taking the time uh, to come to this event. It's good to see some familiar faces. However, uh, for those of you who don't know who OPAD is or NTIA is, a really, really, really brief overview. Uh, NTIA is the National Telecommunication Information Administration. We are an agency within the Department of Commerce, um, and we are uh, do a number of different things. We give out lots of money for broadband. We manage federal spectrum. And we are also, by statute, the, prin the principal advisor of telecommunication and information policy to the president. 
Um, this is a fun fact. That's because part of that office that had that statute actually used to be a part of the White House, and they actually did have that direct line up to the president. Unfortunately, our bat phone now goes through lots of interagency process before it gets to him. Um, uh, but we do still serve in that capacity, and we are kind of like a little bit of a telecommunication information think tank within the federal government. And so what is taking up the majority of our time right now? Um, well, I would say that the plurality is probably what's taking up everybody's time in this space, uh, which is artificial intelligence, right? Uh, so, uh, yes, big sigh from the audience. Uh, we, we've got, um, uh, so we have a couple of different things coming out. We have a report on AI accountability. We did a request for comment last year. The report is forthcoming very shortly. Uh, we, uh, the administration put out the executive order on artificial intelligence, safe and trustworthy artificial intelligence. Um, many of the deadlines are set for 270 days after that. We have one. Um, ours is on uh, AI uh, openness. So essentially dual use foundation models with widely available model weights, as it says in the executive order, which really rolls off the tongue. <laughs> um, but it's ultimately the question about like, replicability and ease of access to the core components of these models such that others can either understand them better or use them or replicate them in ways that have less control and less connection between the developers and the deployers. Um, so we have a request for comment. It just came out. Would really recommend folks take a look at that. Comment, please. Um, this is an important report that we have been told is actually going to the president's desk. Um, uh, because there are some major decision points within administration on those questions. Um, we're also thinking about, we have a task force on kids online health and safety uh, that we're leading along with uh, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, uh, where we are coming out with actual recommendations for industry and for parents on what to do about that. Um, and we're actively engaged on a number of work streams uh, related to telecommunication security, um, such as border gateway routing protocol, but that's not something that I'm going to spend time talking a lot here about. Um, however, one of our long-standing pieces of uh, policy that we have focused on has been privacy. And I was, this is near and dear to my heart because I've been with NTIA for eight years now, and I was brought on to work on the privacy portfolio. And so um, two years ago, we did put out a request for comment on uh, the intersection of privacy, equity, and civil rights. Um, that, unfortunately, AI has kind of sucked a vacuum or created a vacuum out of, anyway, metaphors getting mixed. But um, ultimately, we are still doing that report. We are putting resources to that report. We still want it to come out. Privacy is still a huge priority for this administration. The president has called for privacy, privacy reform, and we think that this report is a good uh, entry into that overarching conversation. And that comes to questions around data portability. One other thing that we did do last year is we did a report on competition in the mobile app ecosystem. Right, thinking through the fact that, for the most part, there are two dominant marketplaces for uh, for mobile apps, and what does that mean for the system, and what are some recommendations of how to move forward? Um, so we've been thinking about competition as well, which is a huge priority for this administration. So the questions around data portability really touch on a number of the different things that are priorities for our office, and by you know because they are our bosses, they they are our priorities because they are the administration's priorities. That's great. You answered three of my questions already. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I'd love to know, um, I'm going to ask you a few questions about coordination. Uh, perhaps this is a bold parallel for me to make, but I do see NTI as similar to, D to, to DTI, NTIA as similar to DTI in that, um, you know, you may not be the biggest agency, but you have a lot of influence when it comes to collaborating and coordinating and bringing stakeholders together. Um, does that seem fair? And, and would you be willing to talk to us a little bit about the processes? Absolutely. Would, uh, would love to. Um, I would absolutely agree that that is one of our core strengths. Uh, we are not a regulatory agency, right? We do, um, it was pointed out to me at one point in time that we have some very minor regulatory power when it comes to for particular aspects of broadband. Um, so when I said we don't have regulatory power, I was told, no, technically you're wrong. Um, but in general, particularly on these issues, we are not a regulator, right? Um, and we do have the strength, um, like other think tanks, I have said this internally, I've said this externally, 
our strengths comes from the power of our ideas, mm -hmm. right? Our ability to argue our, our ideas, both within the administration and in the interagency, to the president, to other agencies, and then externally is where we are able to make an impact. Mm -hmm. And um, while we don't have that regulatory power, what we do have um, is the bully pulpit. We are of the federal government. We are of the administration. And so when we do focus in on issues, it does bring and draw attention to them. Mm -hmm. And that is where, you know, where we try to be very thoughtful about the things that we publicly engage in and where, you know, understanding that stakeholders have limited time, have limited resources, and really trying to weigh in where, um, where things are really important. But in as much as like our power comes from our ideas, there's nothing special about me, right? There's nothing special about the people who work for me, even though I think the world of them and they are, you know, truly world class, like uh, analysts and experts. But there's nothing special about us. What is what makes our ideas powerful is twofold. One, uh, it's our equities, right? So. Um, other departments and agencies, their equities are tend to be fairly mission focused, right? With their missions being, um, you know, with the Department of Justice enforcing, you know, enforcing laws, um, usually within particular offices focused on particular laws. Um, you know, the FTC as a regulator focused on the enforcement of Section 5 authority within that very fairly limited remit, right? Um, uh, our equity is a thriving digital economy. Right? And we take that as meaning not just simply representing the interests of, um, of particular industries, right? but taking into account um, the entirety of the ecosystem, which includes the range of companies up and down the stack uh, who are engaged, the users, the other entities um, and nonprofits and research organizations and universities and others who make the internet a thriving, vibrant place for commerce to happen, right? And so with that, we have a very different voice within the administration than many others, and a very different voice even within the Department of Commerce than others. And to that point, our power and the power of our ideas comes from the ability to draw on that broad range of stakeholders mm -hmm. to actually be able to hear from them, to reach out to them, and to gain insights and uh, knowledge and ideas and lift voices up. Yeah, um, that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, switching gears just a little bit, uh, what do you think are some data portability or not, what do you think are some international opportunities for engagement? Sure. Um, international opportunities for engagement. There are a lot, right? Um, we have, with the European Union, been engaged in um, a administration-long project called, um, I don't know, gosh, you know what? I love acronyms and I hate acronyms because I know, I'm, I'm a DC person. You know you're a DC person when you know the acronym, but you don't know what it stands for. <laughs> <laughs> or you have a general idea, but it might be a little bit wrong, right? So the TTC, right? It's a tra Tech and Trade Council, I want to say, but it's probably, it's probably incorrect. But we have been engaged in the TTC. Uh, NTIA and OPAD have actually been helping to lead up the working group thrive on data issues. Um, and we've been engaged on the other working groups, such as on artificial intelligence. And we have been actively engaged with the Europeans, we have been actively engaged with the UK, which is now a separate inter engagement. Um, uh, we've been also in actively engaged with our like-minded partners at the G7, at OECD, and then on the world stage through the UN, right, and through a number of uh, a couple of different uh, different uh, activities. And I will say that the Europeans are extraordinarily active, right. They're extraordinarily active. They have a number of laws, uh, like you like reference, that are act laws and regulations that are actively going into effect or have been in effect for a while, but um, lay the groundwork for uh, for actually, you know, setting the stage for some of these conversations, right? Um, uh, but at the same time, there is um, quite a bit of engagement to be had with. Um, with the global majority, mm. right? With the folks who, uh, particularly on issues around artificial intelligence, particularly around the issues um, surrounding the um, platforms and norms uh, that deeply affect 
the lo- the lives of the folks who are using them. And the thing is, is that right, you know, going to Costa Rica recently for um, rights for the Rights Con conference, the taxi drivers organize themselves via WhatsApp. Right. These are platforms that people live their lives off of, have their livelihoods based on in ways that if you don't go there, if you don't live it, if you don't see it, you you don't necessarily see. And so policy changes to these platforms, policy changes that um, affect the regulation of these platforms where they are primarily focused on or based in have have ripple effects. And I do think that particularly when we're talking about emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, it is really important to um, not just keep in mind, but to engage and hear what, um, what their needs are, what the particular needs are, what the particular concerns are um, uh, of the, again, not just the governments, but of the users and the folks who are actually affected by them. Yeah, that that resonates. Uh, that resonates a lot. I see a lot of alignment um, and parallels with the goals, processes, challenges, and opportunities um, that we see in our space. So that was very insightful. I appreciate it. Um, so. I'm not going to ask you for predictions of what NTIA will do in the future, especially in an election year, but if somebody, maybe future NTIA, maybe future DTI, um, set out to gather stakeholders to try to advance data portability, what advice would you give them? Or what advice would you give to the stakeholders who could be involved in those processes? Sure. Um, Well, I... Happy to happy to kind of like forecast. I don't know if advice is the right is the right sure. the right term. Um, I you know future NTIA in terms of engagement on data portability. Um, there's a lot there, right? There's a lot there. There's a lot that's going to be there, um, and uh, and so there's act- there's absolutely ample room for um, for an agency such as ours um, and particularly ours to take on if not the general issue of data portability, but some of the conditions and concerns. We have, you know, we have equities in privacy, we have equities in the cybersecurity questions, we have equities in competition. Um, there's certainly there's certainly something there. Um, I, and, um, and then in terms of like the engagement on it, um, you know, it depends a little bit on who the administration and was what their priorities are. Um, but there is space within within government to kind of bubble those ideas up as well. Um, and so in terms of stakeholders and where they are putting their thoughts and emphasis, um, uh, again, I think that there is some degree of like absolutely, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. You're, if you're a regulated, regulated entity who's operating in Europe, yeah, you're going to pay attention to Europe, right? That makes a ton of sense. At the same time, there is quite a bit of, um, I think, uh, thought that can be put into, and I know that Chris and others have put a lot of thought into how to make those changes such that they are um, future-proof and can be like, you know, portable portability policies. Um, puns always intended. Um, I, and and that you know and also to think through um, you know the ways in which these uh, policies to one thing that you know has been great about working at NTIA and can be great about working in these types of issue areas is to reach out to, to stakeholder groups to communities who are off the beaten path of technology, right? Um, but whose lives are still affected, who's, who's, who might be, uh, you know, it's hard to get too many normal people because, you know, you have kids, right? Or you have a job and it's hard to like spend a lot of time paying attention to Washington. But, you know, uh, activist groups and others who think about these issues and help represent people um, who are off the beaten tech path who have equities in it to, be, to help you be thoughtful, mm-hmm right, to become partners in these types of conversations. And I think that we saw that, and I definitely don't think that NTIA gets to take credit for this movement, but I think that, again, from the bully pulpit, we get to take some credit for it being solidified, is that connection between privacy and civil rights, Mm -hmm. right, where we now see civil rights 
communities, civil rights organizations be regular voices in conversations on privacy in ways that they weren't 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you can absolutely draw on these kind of other uh, stakeholders that represent different user groups, represent different folks in the stack who, again, aren't necessarily usually a part of these part times of no, conversations. I appreciate that uh, thoughtfulness towards uh, inclusivity. Uh, and I do think that um, DTI, DTI might have to steal that hashtag portable portability <laughs> policies. So we'll look into that. I think modality is the academic term. <laughs> I don't know. The alliteration is awfully uh, catchy. Um, I'll ask one final question because I do want to leave perhaps a couple of minutes for questions if you might be amenable. Um, any final thoughts or takeaways or anything else that you, you'd you like to leave us with? Um, uh, final thoughts is I, I think that, you know, uh, for this organization, I'm really excited that it, there is some focus specifically on data portability questions, right? Um, getting a little bit philosophical. Questions around privacy are questions around, um, it's the privacy of, of questions around like, it's something public versus private. It's really a question around the politics of data flows, right? The power of data flows. It's pri privacy is the intuitive sense of like folks understanding the you know the kind of like daily you know the, the 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 kind of not big p politics democrat republican but the daily politics of data flows and this we see this in kids the kids space between parents and children right like you don't usually call that politics but it is a type of politics it is power struggle right and so portability is a very interesting and important component over the control of access to and understanding of what happens with data and how it can be used and by whom, right? And so I think that data portability is like, is like in that framework and that understanding of what privacy really is about, portability can truly be a means of empowerment, a means of cracking some of um, uh, or solidifying some uh, of the uh, relational dynamics between users and uh, larger organizations in ways that we want to see them be. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so I think that this work is, is extraordinarily important. It goes into questions, again, competition, of security, mm -hmm. of all of these different things, but I think that it is an important component. So thank we, you. We couldn't agree more. And thank you so much. Do we have um, opportunity for questions? Are there any questions from the audience? It's a very rare opportunity. Take Not advantage. rare at all. My door is actually Take always open. You're always welcome to email. Uh, we have one right here. Thank you, Hallie. I'm not sure you're going to like this question. <laughs> I had the privilege of working in the Clinton-Gore administration, and before that worked for Senator Gore. Uh, you may not know it, but uh, he had the distinction in the 80s of being the only person in Congress of the 535 people there whose eyes did not glaze over immediately when you said the word data management. When I was at the White House, I did a lot of data issues and internet policy, and there were certain agencies that kind of got it. And Sally Katzen at OIRA, OMB, was near the top of that list. And we were able to make a lot of progress rather quickly, partly because the internet was a minor little toy for most people. Now, 30 years later, as you look around, which agencies would you say are the ones that really are leading on these efforts? I mean, obviously you guys are, but commerce is one of many power centers in the, in the government. I won't ask the second question, which is which agencies would you give an F, but tell me the two or three agencies and, and offices within those agencies that are really helping provide some momentum. I, I, I've been so frustrated when everybody agrees on where you want to get to, but we just can't get enough people moving together. The inertia is just too great. Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good and it's an interesting question um, uh, because... I think that one of the issues that we are seeing now is um, that when you have one senator who gets it, 
then it's easy to go and talk to that, or one congressman who gets it, it's easy to go and talk to him. When all 535 think they have the answer, it becomes a lot harder, right? Um, and when it's not just simply that they have the answer, but that they have jurisdiction, right? Then it becomes much more difficult. And so um, who has jurisdiction over the internet? Kind of everybody at this point in terms of like some form or other, certainly not everyone, right? Not, not everyone, everyone, but there are, and again, the question, like the question that we play within the federal government, as as you well know, right, is is the question of equities. Like you get, like I have lot, I have really strong opinions about the environment, but when something comes across my desk about the environment, I don't I don't comment on it because I don't. My agency doesn't have equities in that. So, but in terms of the internet, in terms of online, like uh, uh, the effects of things on uh, that happen online there are equities that are dispersed. Who are the three agencies that are probably most actively involved? Uh, one of the questions that I would have back is, does that mean independent agencies or within the federal government? Because within an independent agency, certainly um, the FTC um, and uh, increasingly, uh, I mean, in many ways already the FCC, but potentially even more so, right? The FCC uh, is going to be engaged in this. Um, and then we also have, um, and then you also can say, and also uh, CFPB, EEOC are becoming more visually engaged. You also have Department of Labor, um, who, who is quite active in its particular work streams. Um, I, OMB plays a huge role. Right, um, in terms of setting the standards for the for the federal government, but then also in this pro in this like oversight role over things that come out, um, uh, and so I'm listing off a whole lot more than just three. But then also, you know, certainly within the federal within the Department of, of Commerce, we have um, uh, NIST, US USPTO, and the International Trade Administration, each with like slightly different equities and slightly different expertise um, in this in this field. So again, I would say that NTIA is unique in that our equities are that and truly that the digital ecosystem, right? That that's really it along, you know, that and telecom. However, there's, um, it's hard to say that any other single agency is necessarily like in charge of or or the main points. Also, I will say that there are differences between administrations, differences in like political powers as it comes through right now. OSTP, NEC, and NSC are quite heavily engaged. That has not always been the case, um, and that those powers centers like shift as well. Thanks for asking. That's second. That's, that wasn't my fault. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is a, a mean question like that one. Um, so. I, I want to sort of ask how, and I think the morning panel uh, with, the, with the scholars and portability in general raises the question of how do you stack rank values? So you mentioned civil rights. It's pretty clear that the administration and probably most of the DC tech policy community has elevated protection of civil rights and its impact on technology to be very high on the list. What do you do about privacy, innovation, competition? Those all seem like equal values that are in conflict with respect to a lot of our data policy and in particular portability. So what do you do? What does the administration do? So you ask a, a difficult question because you're asking about balancing particular values, but it is something that is hard to say outside of context, right? Um, uh, because I think that you can certainly either like because sometimes they are in conflict and sometimes they are not right and so taking taking the the, con, the the conversation here in terms of portability portability can be in conflict with privacy right uh, you can have portability set up in a way such that it is it makes information significantly more easily accessible and with easier access points and fewer gateways to the back end information it becomes easier for um uh for malicious actors 
to access that information, right? Like if you have like a, if you do it wrong, right? If you have a single entry point, it's like very easy to spoof. And then all of a sudden you have, you know, your, your exes, all of their information, right? Like um, current information, all their, you know, private messages, things like that. Um, so, so certainly there can be some degree of conflict there, but then even in that context, that's talking about the actual particular practices and what is necessary in order to do it right. And then it's less a question of um, balancing norms as opposed to allocation of resources. And it's a question of balancing, I mean, in, in terms of question of like balancing the norms of privacy versus um, portability, like the, the benefits of portability, then versus like producing a new product, right? Like these are the kind of like choices that companies do have to make. And oftentimes, you know, doing it truly the right way is not always what the choice that they're going to make. And that's not all, and it's understandable. Um, so, uh, so how do you balance those particular values? I think that you do have to get into some degree of context. Certainly what we have as tools tend to be laws and laws tend to be blunt, blunt objects, right? And so the balancing ends up happening through rulemakings, through court decisions, and through just simply individual company, company practice. Um, and you try to strike the balance as best you can with the blunt instruments that you have. So I, I think we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us, um, for your honesty, for your for your insights. We are incredibly grateful. Please join me in uh, giving a round of applause.